Do you ever regret fighting for Nigerians? Welcome to my channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. Over here, we'll bring you the news on entertainment, sports, international, and local news. Let's continue the video. A lot of people who are going to watch this That's show funny. podcast mm -hmm. never knew that I existed in 1993. And that's why they took history from our curriculum. Mm -hmm. So that even the little history that people should know about their people Thoughts where they could connect not exist they will not anymore. The last time history was written in this country was written about bad guys. And that's the only history that is still present. Mm -hmm. When I was reading history in primary school, on every Independence Day, they would make us line up to wait for the military guys who were stealing money. They would not even come. We'll be there, rain, sunshine, we'll be singing, then nobody will show up. But when I got to the university, I had to fight against the same people in history who I was told mm -hmm. hmm, made Nigeria great. Mm -hmm. So that's why they quietly removed history. So a lot of people don't care also about history anymore. But you see societies that are great don't mess with history. Mm. As much as they are interested in computer science, they are also very interested in where they are coming, where from. They are coming from. Because who that, they will, are. that will help who they are. That will help you determine where you got it wrong and where you need to get it right. Mm -hmm. It will also help you to apportion blames and will help. You know, it's not all history that is good because the people who also always win write history. Mm. Mm. Yes. You are never going to get, for instance, the correct history of the Biafran War because it was mostly written by the guys who won the war. Mm. Yeah. So you only have a few people on the side that fought who you can read their history, but you can't find it anymore. In this country, Ken Sarawiwa was killed. You know the first thing they did after they killed him? They removed his books from the literature curriculum in the, in the schools in this country. I don't know if they've restored it now. Talking about Biafra. Yes. You had a meeting yes. with Namdi Kano and that sparked, in fact, at, at New the, York. Yeah, I think you got arrested after that yes. meeting. People would say, mm. you people are not fighting the same cause. You are fighting to be the president of the country. Yes. He is fighting to divide the country. Yes. People would say, why would you be seen? in such a meeting would you like to clear that <laughs> you see, anybody that lacks any sense of consciousness would ignore social movements that is the problem with nigerian leadership you cannot have a country in which there are 251 tribes or languages and one big section says we are not satisfied with here and you don't talk to them you don't understand them then you are not a leader of that country. The reason I met him was to understand first what his struggle was about, which I knew already. And secondly, to also advise him on the way that I think we could all work together. And thirdly, to send a message to the Nigerian people that we can work through our differences, even at these levels. And I was surprised that contrary to what some people are saying, he did not want Nigeria to break up. He wanted the Nigeria where the Igbo man can survive. But for an Igbo man to survive in Nigeria, as it is currently put together, Nigeria must break. Wait, to, <laughs> na, the meeting you had with Namde Kano. Yes. He, you are telling us now that Namde Kano, from what you understand from the yes. meeting with him, yes. he does not want Nigeria to break, to divide. No, he, he said clearly that it is too late for Nigeria to come together. But he gave his condition. We, we live streamed the meeting now. It's, oh. it's online. Okay. And part of it was live streamed. Some of them were private. But he said that he feels that if Nigeria were to respect certain protocols, including a referendum inserted in the constitution, and he still says it even now in court, that if he's released, he will go back and end the bloodshed in, the bloodshed in, his, uh, in that part and that a conversation can, he, he, he says that in every court appearance, that he's being held, is not helping the opportunity to have a conversation about whatever it is, the unity you are begging for. <laughs> but you see, Nigeria has a problem 
And I've always said, Nigeria has an Igbo problem. And I'm not saying it to please people who are known as Igbos. Mm. But the moment they decided to take the action they took in 1967 to 1970, the war, Nigeria, having won that war in their eyes, never forgave the Igbos. That is the reality. And if I were to be president of Nigeria today, the first thing I would do is to head to the Southeast and apologize to them for the war. Part of it is that I'd never participated in it. And I cannot continue to fight a war that I did not engage in. And then ask them, what do we want? So are you saying that the federal government has, till, like even before Successive now, governments. Successive governments. Yes. They've always had this anger against the Igbos. There is a secret memo. I don't know where it is located <laughs> in government. <laughs> that whenever we want to take charge in this country, be careful of the Igbo. Don't give them position. Don't give them opportunity. Otherwise, they will overrun. It's a, it's, it's a well-known fact. Even our parents wow. tell us, ah, Igbo. You understand? Mm. Some of them even say it unconsciously. They even say it on radio shows in this country. So don't let us lie to ourselves because except we bring this out openly yes. and discuss is a taboo that we have refused to discuss true we are not going to solve the problem it is the reason why the federal government of nigeria feels that in 2024 detaining nam de kanu against all the court orders against all the court rulings is the only way to go mm -hmm. you know i was detained in the dss place for five months yes there's nothing there to detain anybody for the place is not even functioning the DSS headquarters. Mm. Yes, is it the same DSS people who are watching BB Ninja from morning to night? <laughs> ah, <laughs> no, it's true now. And I was there with them for five months. I've said oh this publicly. God. So all the institutions in this country are broken down. But let's get back to the reality. One thing I've told people is that you are looking at Igbos as the only people who want to secede. But who in this country today has not mentally seceded from Nigeria? Mm. Mm. Mentally seceded. Mm. Who has not left? Mm. Except those who are trapped. If anybody in this country is working in a bank and he has 10 million naira and somebody says you can get into Canada, he will leave the next day. I swear. Is that not secession? Is it, what word of secession is that you leave a country, yes. you say to that country goodbye. Bye. And not do it You again. get to the other country, you bow down, you touch the, the soil. Uh, the soil. And, it's really mm. if you go down. and then you mm. renounce your citizenship of the country you are coming from. Ah. Is that not what they call secession? Mm -hmm. So, if you want to look at the number of people that have seceded in that Jackpa syndrome, there are more than all the Igbos combined together who are asking to leave. <laughs> and in the process of keeping Nigeria united, we have let go of more citizens than the country should have. Mm. Yes. So you think... If they had, uh, uh, if they had, because I mean, from the last thing you said now, mm. you say in the process of trying to keep Nigeria united, yes. we have let go of more citizens than we should have. Of course. So if we had allowed for the division or secession of Nigeria, most of our citizens that are outside would not have been outside. No, you see, it is not the secession I'm talking about. Okay, what are you talking about? It is what led to, to, the, to the war that oh, we did okay. not address. Okay. And what happened after the war? Why is it that Nigeria hasn't been, over, been able to overcome the Biafran problem? It's because Nigeria never addressed the what the course. Biafrans were asking for before the war. What were they asking for? They were asking for to be treated not as second-class citizens in this country. Mm. Don't you know what happened, the COP program in this country, where people were slaughtered and their bodies and their heads placed inside the train going down south? Yes, from the north, from the north, from the mid, you know, the, 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 the different parts of the north. Are we ignoring that? So that happened. Before course, the war? Before yes, the war. Yes. That's what they call pogrom. Hmm. You know, people who were settled, doing well, were, they were sort of slaughtering them and <laughs> sending their bodies and their heads inside Calabash and sending on trains that was heading east. Were they Easterners? They were Easterners. Yes, no, Why are you asking me? Is, is there in... Go and Google it now. 
So you expect that that will happen. And then there was a war that eviscerated 3 million people. Wow. And when the war was over, you just say, oh, nobody was vanquished. Nobody was victorious. <laughs> and then three hours. But you still kept a memo and said, don't trust them. Hmm. Collect people money. Yes. Give them 20 pounds. And then you took their property. So Juku did not get back Jamb until 1992. Now his father's house that is known as Jamb headquarters here in Ekoi. Hmm. It was after he came back from Ivory Coast. It was Babangida, I think, that gave him back their property. So any country that is perpetually carrying out systemic injustice against will lose more citizens than they should have. The reason why cities, countries that are working work is because citizens believe in their country. And you cannot force that belief. It has to come through social justice. It's true. It has to come through economic justice. Why is it that, you know, my children can feel like they are U.S. citizens? Yeah. Even though they were born there, it's because before you they let you take them out of the hospital, they must take all their all their uh, immunity everything uh, injections. You know you cannot put them at home and not go back to the doctor to go and complete it. And when it's time for school, they cannot be out of school for two days. And you'll be saying that no, I want Shikira to go and be selling pure water. <laughs> you will go to jail. So and then when it's time for them to get to go to college. There is loan, there is grant, you know. Um, you are talking far. If, if, if so, you bond them in the hospital, you cannot even go home with that child if they have not approved no, you to go home no, no, not with only, the child. Not only that, you cannot That's even throw man. your child up <laughs> in the hospital the way we do it here. Now we just start playing with mm. your child. You can't. You are not allowed to just let your child fly in the air. They say you want to ruin their brain. <laughs> we, when we're born, we see happens now. They will put hot water in your ass. They will be murmuring. They will be using hot, you know, rag to be pushing your head together. In the process, maybe that's where they shift some of our brains. Now why are we not yeah. correct? <laughs> <laughs> so it is fundamental that we understand that what makes people feel like citizens is what their country has to offer to them. And then they in turn would offer something back to their mm. country. Sometimes their life. Yeah. And it's a question people ask me, why would you have all this life and come back and be suffering here? I said to them, we are built differently. Some of us, this is how we've designed our convictions. There are some of us that even fight for country we have never been to before. I fight for Palestinians. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I fight for South Africans. Why can't I fight for my own people? Nigerians. I, the, 200 million people on the largest continent on earth. In, in, on, it, see, still on the election. Still on but the but election. Wait, before thing. election, no verse. Before election. No, no, based on the last thing that he said. Okay. Sorry, my brother. No problem. You said... You fight for Palestinians. You fight for South Africans. Yes. Why can't you fight for Nigerians? Yeah. I mean, maybe this question should be later, later end. But let me just bring it up before I forget. Do you ever regret fighting for Nigerians? Because there are some times that you go online, you see some things. And look at the people I'm fighting for. <laughs> they are busy talking about crews. They are busy talking about who is fighting. Yeah, with, um, they are talking about busy talking about whiskey. Some women say, say Zukwani. Some people yeah. now say, ah, eh, eh, show a <laughs> You two rest in Jesus' name. <laughs> Do you ever regret fighting for these people? No. The only thing people must understand about fighting for people is that it's a tankless job. Mm. It's a if, tankless mm. job. Yeah. Mm. If you expect something from it, you'll be very, very disappointed. And you that's where the trauma comes from for people who sometimes will just get arrested by police one time and you never hear from them again. Because that period that you have expectation for people to rise and support you and if they are not there, it traumatizes people a lot. Mm. I know what it is. It's really part of reasons why if I hear that somebody is suffering oppression, I intervene in the best possible way I can to get them out. Because it's a very slippery slope. And But for me, I don't expect anything from anybody. I don't expect to be paid. I don't expect to be praised. If I was expecting something or, you know, from people, when I wanted to start Sahara Reporters, I would have been putting pictures of rich people. It's the easiest way to get rich. Just go to their weddings. For magazines. You know, put no them shit. there in the best, ask them to bend, <laughs> you know, and take nice pictures of them. That's not the way to offend people. 
But I took the route of uh, offensive journalism. And that means you are fighting powerful people. And powerful people are very <laughs> powerful in such a way that even some of the most reasonable people can be asked by powerful people to work against their own interests. Mm. And, and, they, and, and they, they will do it, and they will they will do it with... more than the people who are oppressing them. Mm. 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 And that's what Nigeria has shown us. Some of the people who are most virulent in attacking people who are doing good themselves don't benefit anything. It's called programming. Mm. True. They've been, they've been programmed. That's their own default position to fight first and foremost the person who's for them. And lastly, if at all, the person who's against them. Thank you for watching. I appreciate your support. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more exciting videos. I can't wait to see you back here again. Bye-bye.